Hello everyone, Rob Guest from Football.London here and welcome to the latest episode of Gold and Guest Talk Tottenham, sponsored by NordVPN. Joining me today, it's Lee Wilmot. I suppose you're very happy after last night. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty happy, yeah, in, in a good mood. Um, hopefully you're right as well, Guesty. I know Ali always forgets to ask you how you are when uh, he does these. I'm stepping in again because Ali's still on holiday. Um and uh, despite the fact I'm also on annual leave this week, I thought I couldn't couldn't leave you on your own just talking to no one. Uh, so I thought I'd come on the pod uh, and join you, even though I'm, I'm supposed to be off work. And as anyone who's watching on YouTube can see, I'm wearing a different piece of Spurs merch this week. Not the same jumper that I've been wearing for the last two weeks on the pod. Um, so, yeah, there was one comment on the video last week saying petition to uh, buy Lee some more Spurs merch. Don't worry, I do have more. I did promise I had more. Um, so, yes, here, ni- nice black one. I'm, I'm quite fond of this one. Yeah, so nice positive podcast today following that brilliant 2-1 win over Manchester City in the fourth round of the Carabao Cup. Timo Werner getting a much-needed goal early on in the contest. Pat Matasar scoring and then Matthias Nunes uh, reduced deficit for City just before half-time, but they couldn't get another one. And Spurs have gone through to the fifth round of the competition. Manchester United next up in the fifth round. That is week commencing Monday, December the 16th. Uh, got to wait quite a while until that game, but it'll come around pretty quick. Uh, we'll start with last night. And I think the team news was probably what everyone was fully focused on because what we've seen before with Ange in the Carabao Cups, he's rotated heavily. He did that at Fulham last season, did that against Coventry uh, in September. But it was one of these where you don't want to make too many changes coming up against City. Uh, and I think the thing is, no one knew how City were going to line up because Pep had said previously, wasn't going to waste energy on the competition probably going to give some of the academy players uh, a game and I think there was a tweet before the game from this Man City like fan account basically saying that uh, Guardiola's team is basically to thank Tottenham for helping them win the league last year so you think (laughs) it's going to be like a load of kids (laughs) but then it wasn't it was really really strong even though the likes of Aileen Haaland and a few others were left out but with Andrew's team I mean, pretty much what we expected, I guess. Yeah, I think, like, first of all, the, the Man City team, when I looked at it, when the teams came out last night, I thought that's a strong back line. Um, but then the rest of the team, you, you kind of felt there were, there were gaps there and opportunities for Spurs to get out. But if, if Spurs are going to get at Man City, you felt like they needed a little bit of help in the, in the back line. And, and I looked at the uh, Pep's defence and thought, oh, he's, he's gone quite strong there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, with, with Spurs team selection, I thought it was quite clever from Ange, really. He's made, he's made two or three changes. Um, and so it looks like he's given some players, like Archie Gray at right back, for example. Dragusin's come in at centre-back. Um, Timo Werner's got a start um, on, the, on the left-hand side of, of the front three. Um, so, yeah, it was yeah. I, I thought it was quite clever. He knew he couldn't rotate everything because it's Man City. And yes, it wasn't the strongest Man City side out there, but... I think as we saw as the game went on, the, the young players that they started and the young players that they could bring on, actually, their academy's pretty damn good, isn't it, at Man City? They, they've got some really talented players that are all learning from the Pep Guardiola style of play. So, yeah, just to make a few tweaks, um, giving Archie a run out at right back. Um, he had a difficult night, obviously, with Mateus Nunes. Um, Timo Werner getting a run out and getting a goal, doing wonders for his confidence. Uh, yeah, I was I was, I was, was pleased with the, with the team selection. Um and yeah, as I say, I thought it was quite clever from Ange. What, what did you make of the, the selection when, when you first got it in the stadium? I thought it was pretty much what it was going to go with anyway. I think in terms of me predicted team, I think I got nine out of 11. I thought he might go with Porro at right back uh, and then Spence, if he was fit, uh, at left back. But uh, the other players, basically, the positions... And the players picked themselves. Uh, but yeah, I think you just got it bang on last night in terms of the team. And it's one of these where you've said you always win a trophy in your second season. Spurs are desperate for silverware. You cannot take any chances, regardless of whatever Guardiola's gone to do. You've just got to go as near to full strength as you can. And thankfully, it paid off in the end with... Spurs getting the win and you know what helped them on the way was just making the best possible start to the game and five minutes in 
Timo Werner, first goal of the season and what a goal as well. Oh, it was brilliant. Brilliant to see him score that and the kind of smile on his face. He's, he's always quite a, an upbeat, um, smiley person anyway, isn't he? He's kind of, you, you see him in social media videos and stuff like that. So it, it it doesn't feel like he's lacking in confidence when you see him kind of away from the football pitch sometimes. Um, but then you see him on it and doesn't doesn't hit the back of the net when he should do. But yeah, what what a tonic that'll be for him for moving forward. Um, he needed that and almost got a second in the second half as well when he when he was played through. And I, I looked at it and thought, oh God, um, it's, it's another one where he's missed and he should have scored. And when you're one-on-one, you, you, you have to say you should score really. But he was so close with that as well. When you see the replay from behind the goal, it was millimetres past the, the far post. And yeah, you, you can argue that it's millimetres too wrong essentially he should have scored because it's one on one but um yeah i thought he did, i thought he did well last night um and and to get that goal yeah the confidence should be flowing through him you might have expected him to put that second chance away given he'd scored the one in the first half but not quite the way with timo werner obviously um but hopefully we'll see him pop up with a goal I would, i'd like to say hopefully from the bench because hopefully sonny will be fit for uh, sunday but we don't, we don't know yet do we so um yeah hopefully he can uh, come on and shine on on sunday yeah, Timo in his interview with Spurs play after the game was saying now he's now hoping for to score many more goals for Tottenham and hopefully that is the case and yeah, he did admit it's been a tough few weeks but one thing that he has continued to do even if he is missing those chances is making those runs into the box because I think he said it'd be stupid not to, to stop doing that because then you're just not going to have those openings on goal and it was now, the finish of a player who was high in confidence, not someone with dwindling confidence. It was emphatic, gave Ortega no chance. But, I mean, that was such a good move. And that all came from Spurs playing out from the back. It was Romero and Dragosin just taking the time on the ball, waiting uh, for the gaps to open up. Then I think it was Arch Gray played it down the line and Brennan Johnson with a brilliant flick to release Dane Kulaseski and... As good as Werner's goal was, that pass from Kulisesi mm-hmm. was something else. Just put it on the plate from a really hard ball to make as well, just to play it across uh, the edge of the area and just to be basically pinpoint precision for Werner. With his wrong to, foot as well. Yeah, to hit it first time so far. Looking at it, Rico Lewis might end up getting on the end of this, but perfection and yeah, what a finish from Werner. And I think the celebrations said it all basically because literally all the team came over to him. I think he's quite clearly a popular member at Tottenham and everyone's quite clearly been willing for him to score these chances. It's not happened, but yeah, really great to see. Uh, Unlucky with one in the first half as well when he gained possession outside the box. Shot straight at Ortega, but uh, the one in the second half, as you said, that was just like millimetres away. You can't usually tell how close it is on the normal TV angle, but when it showed it from behind yeah. the net, yeah, inches away from hitting the tag. And I mean, that was superb play from Dom Solanke as well. Just really good hold-up play and a good through ball. And he just used his pace to go through and a bit of a tight angle, unlucky. Uh, but that would have just caps off a brilliant night for Werner if he'd managed to get that one. Do you know one thing I'd, I'd liked about his goal actually? Um, if you, if you watch it back, you kind of he he stops just slightly to sort his body out to make sure he can get onto it first time and and kind of use his body to guide it into the into the far corner of Ortega's net. Essentially, um, you look at it and you think, oh, that that's maybe someone who's a bit hesitant. hesitant. But he, what he was doing, he was getting his body in the right position to finish that off first time. So it was really good to see. And yeah, didn't. I think that's the one thing you think about with Timo Werner, isn't it? As long as he doesn't have too much time to think about something, he just walked onto it and hit it. And once he got his body right, um, perhaps he had a little bit too much time with that second one. He didn't need to go high into the top corner for that. He could have gone low across um, Ortega into, into his near post or his far post. Um, and there was another opportunity in the second half that when um, it was Dan Kulisevsky, um, when he cut in from the right and shot that Ortega saved going into the far corner. As Kodosevsky was running across halfway with that, I thought, go on, ping this like you did with the first goal, ping it across for Werner on the um, on the left-hand side. He chose not to um, and had a good chance himself in the end uh, on his left foot, which Ortega did well to save, obviously. But you do you do wonder if he put that across for Werner in, uh, when, like he had done with the first goal. He might, he might have scored a second there as well. Yeah, I think with that one, he basically had to play it across straight away. 
The yep. fact that he took a touch and two, the other defenders closing in, that means Solanke and Verde, you're just not going to get the ball to him in that situation. And it was a good save from Ortega. I think Kuliseski did the right thing in that situation after initially taking the touch. That probably limited his options. Uh, but Spurs did have that really good spell, literally just after half time with those Werner and Kuliseski chances. But even though they uh, missed them, thankfully, it didn't prove uh, too costly. And uh, one thing that, you know, was a bit of a scare immediately after the goal was Mickey van der Ven going down with an injury. Uh, he was competing with Savinho, uh, Man City's right winger. Van der Ven left back uh, last night due to a bit of a change of the back line. I think Destiny getting a well and breather on the bench. Ben Davis probably viewed as a centre back now. I think it's fair to say that's where the vast majority of his football is coming and Jed Spence not available uh, despite returning to training this week. So Van der Ven, it was 12 minutes on the clock when he came off and he was absolutely gutted mm. to be coming off the pitch. You could tell it just by his reaction, it looks to be a serious hamstring injury. Uh, pulled his shirt over his head uh, when, when coming off. You could just see the tears uh, starting to form and that Ibisuma recognised that his teammate needed consoling, so he left the bench and you know gave him a hug and walked down the uh, tunnel with him. And Andrew was asked about him after the game. Says, yeah, it basically looks like uh, a hamstring injury. Don't know the severity of it now, but Andrew will be speaking to the media on Friday, and I think hopefully things will become clear. And fingers crossed, it's not a serious one. So you just don't want to be missing such an influential player. How how long was he out last season? Can you remember? Uh, start of November, wasn't it? So a similar time, and he came back early January. Was it Manchester United the way, or maybe the week after? Yeah, it might have been. I'm just going to look on um, transfer marked. Are generally pretty good with their injury history and tell you how many games um, players missed. So. Uh, no, November 6, 2023 until January, January 1st, 2024. Missed 12 games, um, apparently, for Spurs, according to Transfer Mart. Yeah, well, I think the good thing is now Spurs have sufficient cover at centre-back. Yeah. You've got a really good player in Radha Dragson to come in, who was excellent last night, and we'll move on to him in a bit. But, yeah, certainly a blow uh, to be losing Van der Ven. Yeah, as you say, he, he looked absolutely devastated. And when, when you see a player reacting in that way you you know it's bad don't you really um you you know well the player knows in himself that there's something there's something wrong um lo looked okay when he was sat on the bench afterwards um didn't obviously got his um thoughts together and uh kind of gathered himself essentially so hopefully it's not a 12 game missing spell like last time uh but with hamstring injuries you, you never know do you they, they they can take a while and yeah he'll be a, he'll be a massive loss but as you say, an opportunity for Raddy Dragosin to step up and and prove his worth, essentially, under Ange Postacoglu, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I suppose in terms of Van der Ven, these are the injuries you don't want him to be getting yeah. just because of his attributes and his pace is a key part of his game as well. And I think Ange said towards the end of last season he'd not use Van der Ven as an option at left-back because of uh, the previous hamstring issues and the pace. That's just the main you know, key area of his game. And you want to avoid any more issues. And yeah, it's just an unfortunate one, but gives Radu Dragostin a chance. I was going to say 12 minutes into playing him at left-back again, it's happened. So, <laughs> and stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> but yeah, as we're saying, Dragostin last night, I thought it was brilliant at the back. Certainly one of the standout players. And... He was really good against City at home last season uh, in May when he was needed at centre back. The minutes, regular minutes he wants, haven't been there for him since he moved from Genoa. He's gone from being a regular in Serie A to playing a bit part role. Didn't help himself with that red card uh, against Carabag in the Europa League, which meant he missed out against Ferenc Varos. But Despite his lack of minutes, you couldn't tell he was rusty at all last night. It was a really dominant display at the back and uh, a number of important headers, uh, a number of important tackles. And there was one header early in the, probably midway inside the first half when City looked to attack down their right. 
Dragasin got a header in just in front of Guardiola's bench. Uh, important one as well because uh, Ange applauded him and then gave him a pat on the back as well when he was uh, running back into play. Uh, but yeah, I thought he was probably one of the standout players last night. Yeah, the best thing I can probably say about him um, as a centre back is that I didn't I didn't really notice he was he was there essentially I didn't really notice that Mickey Van der Ven wasn't next to Christian Romero, um, went about his business, um, dealt with everything that came his way either on the floor or in the air essentially, um, and yeah, really really good performance and he's going to be needed um, in the coming weeks if if Mickey Van der Ven is out so yeah great for him and and his confidence to kind of have a game like that against Matt, obviously it wasn't against Erling Haaland um, and it wasn't against Kevin De Bruyne playing through balls and um, Bernardo Silva didn't play for very long. Um, but yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll do him the world of good, I think. And yeah, as, as, as I've said there, we, we Spurs need him uh, to kind of step up to the plate and and hold down the fort while Mickey van der Ven is clearly the first choice for um, Ange Postecoglou. And I think, most Tottenham fans would, would tell you that he's probably one of the best defenders in the Premier League. Um, so he's, he's got a task on his hands, Raddy Dragosin, to try and oust Mickey van der Ven. But all he, all he can do is show his best self, essentially, when he's in the team. And yeah, we, we need that in the next few weeks. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Tottenham's second goal. And we've seen a number of short corners uh, for Spurs this season. Not always come off, but this one did. And what a goal from Pat Matasar as well. It was Werner and Kuliseski who worked the short corner. Kuliseski teed Sar up on the edge of the box and this curling effort from 25 yards out gave Ortega no chance. The whip on it was incredible because uh, they showed it on the big screen after and there was just all the fans inside the stadium pretty much just gasped when, when they saw it from the angle from behind the net with the amount of bend he got on it to make you go in the bottom corner and he's chipped in with yeah. some important goals this season. I think he's got three so far. Does look does like scoring in the cup competitions. Yeah, he's um I'd all take a belly moved. Um, I think that that's how far it started wide of his post. Um, that it, it, I don't think he expected the whip that um, Pat Matasar got on that. But yeah, incred- incredible curl on that ball to um, to find the back. I didn't. I don't think it got anywhere near the the post either. There's so, there's so much. It wasn't like it was right in the corner. But by the time it got to the back of the net, um, so yeah, the amount of curl he got on that was incredible. And yeah, good to see it come off because, as you say, we do take a lot of short corners and. Uh, I coach my son's football team and um, they're under 14s now and none of them really like heading the ball. Um, so I tell them, why, why do you keep, why do you keep booting balls into the, in the air in, in for a corner? Why don't we play more short corners? And I, I, I quite like a short corner anyway. Um, when it comes off, um, I think they're much more difficult to kind of defend against, even if you're going to play it short and then really quickly whip it in after that, because it just makes the defenders in the middle think about where they are and think about the position and, and move slightly because of the movement in the box. Um, but yeah, really, really good to see. Um, and as you say, I thought he was really good last night. Paps are um, capped, capped with a goal. Um, and yet I think just a dominant performance from Spurs really. I, I wasn't, Last five ten minutes, it, we weren't keeping hold of the ball particularly well, um, and let City come at us, which I suppose is to be expected for a team of, of City's caliber. But I think in the main, that the one chance they had, which we're going to talk about in a minute, obviously, uh, that, that was that was it. Really, I don't think they had too many clear cut chances, and 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 Spurs, I think, were the, the, the better team, and the be- the better team went through. Yeah, I can't think of a save the carrier had to make. No, honest. I was just thinking that then when I was talking. I, I wonder if there was one, but there wasn't. I think it went wide. It was one that he watched. Oh, yeah, it was one that he watched wide from one of the young players, I think it was. Um, a curling effort that went just past the post. And I said to my son afterwards, I said, well, Vicario had it covered. And he went, yeah, you think so? And I said, well, you just look at look at the... Re- his, his hand is right there, essentially. If it's coming inside the post, Vicario is saving that. So, uh, But yeah, you're right. I don't think he had anything else really to do. No. Uh, City did have some... Decent openings in the first half. And then Foden volleyed over uh, with a decent effort. Had a shot blocked as well. Uh, but yeah, City were just starting to come into it a bit more. 10, 15 minutes before the halftime whistle. And in those four minutes of added time, the one thing you needed to do was just 
see it out and get into yeah. halftime with a two goal lead because Ange had actually been asked in his press conference about this recent trend in 2 0 leads just being completely evaporated because Brentford, uh, Ipswich winning 2 0 at Brentford the other day. Uh, Brentford won, I think Coventry were 2 0 down against Luton and then won. 2 0 is not always a safe lead in, in football. as we know. Yeah, from a few weeks ago, hundred <laughs> uh, percent. So it yeah, it was wasn't a good one to concede at all. I thought Destiny Doggy probably sh- should have done better in terms of closing Savinio down. Maybe very similar to Jared Bowen the other week uh, in the West Ham game, and then you can probably look back at the Brighton game as well with that. And Nunes finished it well at the back post, but he was just left all alone and. I, I don't know who it is because uh, Arch Gray's come across to cover McAtee, I think. Is that mainly because Brendan Johnson's not trapped McAtee and Gray's had to leave Nunes at the back post? I don't know, but the City players shouldn't be left no. naked of space to convert at the end the of one, the one thing, The one thing that is frustration is that that seems to happen a f- fair number of times with yeah. Tottenham, that the, the, the right back is either out of position or covering for someone and it leaves someone completely free at the back post from from across from the opposition's right hand side so yeah that i think that will frustrate tottenham fans a lot that we're seeing similar two similar goals happen too often which you would think would be easily coachable but i'm i'm only a coach for an under 40 i'm not <laughs> i'm not a premier league coach so and and you'll probably tell me differently that it's not easy to coach um but you you would think that you would be able to stop making the sa- is it a mistake? It is a mistake if you're conceding goals, I suppose. Stop making the same mistake again. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that is a frustration. Um, did, didn't didn't Everton lose a 2-0 lead at some point this season as well, Guesty? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll swiftly move on. Yeah. That does not need talking about. <laughs> uh, right, well, what we'll do... We I've thrown you one. there, haven't I? Yeah, you have. This one's been planned. Uh, what we'll do uh, before we move on and talk about the second half, we'll talk to you now about the benefits of using NordVPN. Um, big one for you today, Lee, because uh, I think there was a comment <laughs> in the YouTube uh, video previously criticising you. Apparently, you can't hold a candle to Ali. I know, I know. Ali, Ali Ali uses NordVPN all the time and he's off on his travels all the time um, that he gets to use it more than I do. So, uh, yeah, apologies that I, I can't give you the kind of enthusiasm and the uh, the benefits of massive experience that Ali does about using NordVPN. But I will try my best um, and to give you um, everything that um, Nord Nord stands for, essentially. So um, hopefully Ali, Ali's still using it. Hopefully he's still out um, using it in America, although <clears throat> he's probably traveling. I think he's traveling back today or tomorrow, isn't he? So um, perhaps his uh, perhaps his time using Nord is done now. Um, but yeah, if you're not aware by now, the Golden Guest Talk Tottenham podcast is sponsored by NordVPN, and you can use their service in a host of different ways to enhance your internet experience. NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world. And that means there's no buffering, no lagging like I am, I'm doing with my voice at the minute. And you can stream your favorite shows from anywhere in the world without your bandwidth throttling. You can use Nord to set your device to thinking it's back in the UK and just watch your programs as normal. Not only that, but the outlay on a Nord VPN subscription is cheaper for you in the long run. And that's because you can purchase streaming services in other countries at a much cheaper rate. So, for example, you can change your virtual location to the US where Ali has been enjoying himself. Um, and you could maybe book flights from the US or any other country you want to book flights from. Also, there's the security aspect of it. It's a great system for pretty much going as far as you possibly can to stop people stealing things off your device when you connect to a public Wi-Fi. It's such a clever app that you can install it on any device and you, any device that you've got. And it's easy to set up and you can get straight on going with it. There's a whole host of other benefits from signing up to NordVPN. So why not give it a go? To get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. Our link will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, and the link is in our episode description box. So Hopefully that was all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that'll uh, do the job. Uh, right, second half then. Spurs made a change right from the off, and that was Yves Basuma. Coming onto the pitch for Pat Matasar, not really too much of a surprise. Sarah had been given a booking in the first half and 
you know, two one up against City, you know what they can offer in the final third. You don't want to be taking any risks at all. And Basuma came on. It was a tactical change, and and basically said in his post match game, in his post match press, that uh, he wanted to bring Basuma on uh, just to help in the build up play and help Spurs get a bit more of a foothold in midfield alongside Rodrigo Bentica because they've got into few sticky situations towards the end of the first half and Basuma was brilliant I thought when he came on really helped uh, Spurs in terms of the play just someone who's calm on the ball who can use it well put his foot in again like Saar got a booking didn't he about eight <laughs> minutes, eight minutes uh, after coming on fa- fouling Nico O'Reilly uh, he made one Another uh, foul not long after, and you're thinking he's going to get sent off here. Uh, but no, managed to uh, get through the game unscathed. And I mean, what a block that was <laughs> in the final few minutes. That was a match winning block from Basuma. Uh, I think Connor came in, Vicario, you know, flapped at it, got nowhere oh. near it, and fell kindly to Nico, Nico O'Reilly. It was volley looked like he was heading into the bottom corner, but Basuma there on the line with his left foot uh, to divert it away from danger. And that was a big moment in the contest because Scott, that going to penalties. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> there's one thing you can be certain of. It's that a Spurs midfielder will get booked um, during a game, at least one of them on this occasion too. Um and yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, we were going to talk about Basuma and just re- reminded me of that Vicaro in there. And um, I was having a conversation with my wife and she was going, oh, he's such a good keeper, isn't he? Uh, and then two minutes later, randomly comes for a corner that he was never going to get to. Um, and I, d- I don't know what he was doing. Um, but yeah, you have those little moments with Vicario and you have those little moments with a lot of goalkeepers, to be fair. Um He's not, he's not the only one um, that's guilty of doing things like that. But yeah, he is an incredible shot stopper at the very least. Perhaps a little bit of work needs to be done on, on his on his crosses. But um, yeah, Pesuma on the line. Incredible, incredible block. And you saw what it meant to him afterwards as well. The kind of, <clears throat> there's a lot, lots been made about defenders um, celebrating blocks and celebrating tackles and stuff like that, which why not really? I don't, I don't, why, why wouldn't you do that? If, we celebrate goals, um, so why not celebrate um, stopping goals like like he did? And yeah, that was um, exceptional and essential um, at the same time because yeah, would have would have gone to penalties. Um, yeah, what what a block! And I'm a big fan of Basuma's anyway. He, he can, I think he can, has the potential to go missing in games. But um, yeah, I thought he was excellent in the second half yesterday. Yeah, he was, and so was Rodrigo Bentica. Uh, he was steady away once again. I thought it was really good uh, six days ago against AZ in the Europa League and just carried on from that performance. Just the calming influence in the middle of the pitch, just uses the ball really well, puts his foot in. Uh, yeah, he's it's been a bit unfortunate for him. Again, it's just been a bit of a stop start season. You know, he, he seems to be in the team one week and then out all of a sudden. Uh, but you can just see how much of an influence he can have in the middle of the park when he's on song. And I thought he was uh, really, really good. Uh, what did you make of Archie Gray's performance last night? Yeah, it, it was it was tough for the young lad, wasn't it? Um, Mateus Nunez obviously got a bit of a point to prove because he's not been getting in um, Man City's first team. Um, so to kind of make do with sitting on the bench under Pep Guardiola, um, but yeah, you, we we know he's a quality player, um, and yeah, he's kind of shown it at Wolves and is, is trying to kind of force his way into Pep's thinking at Man City. So I, th- I, w- I think we're all always, always going to expect a big game from from him last night. And uh, yeah, Archie had his work cut out. I think um, I don't think he always got the help that he needed um, from Bren Johnson last night. Um, and that the three in midfield obviously didn't, not, not tasked with coming over to kind of help the right back essentially. But yeah, bits bits and pieces of his game that I liked last night. I, I like how calm he is on the ball. I like how he likes to get things, get forward and likes to play a pass inside or wants to take a one-two essentially um, and, and get, get things moving on, get things on the front foot. But yeah, right back against Man City. Not the strongest Man City, let's let's say, obviously, but right back against Man City in his first season in the Premier League, it was never going to be an easy night for him, I don't think. Um, and I think he gave a reasonable account of himself. But as I've said on here before, and as you guys have said, 
I'm sure he would be preferring to play in that central midfield position rather than at right covering at right back just because that's where he's covered before and he, he's he's oh, he's happy he's happy-ish there. Um, I think he would prefer to be in that central midfield position. Yeah. He's probably played the vast majority of his career or professional career as a right back yeah. since he broke through uh, a lead now. Uh, but yeah, a bit of a baptism of fire for him last night coming in against, you know, the Premier League's best. I think Nunes has had a bit of a tough time at the Etihad since he's moved from Wolves, but I think in recent weeks he just looks a lot better, seems to be playing a bit more. I think it was him who set Haaland's goal up the other day against Southampton as well. And he was really impressive. He's a tricky player. He's got bags of pace and he would just seem to be skinning grey time and time again in the first half. And it was really tough for him. But I think, as you mentioned, the good thing is actually just carries on and yeah. he's always calm on the ball and he'll look to the, just make use of the ball in the best way possible, won't lose his head. And the fight was a lot, lot better in the second half. Uh, certainly more composed. Again, used the ball really well, helped Tottenham mount some attacks down uh, the right flank. And again, as Andrew said, y you want your players to be exposed to these maybe difficult moments and see how they react. And that's only going to benefit them in the long run. And I think last night's performance will help Archie become uh, a better player because, again, the vast majority of his fo football has come in the Europa League this season. It's minutes here and there in the Premier League coming off the bench. Uh, so to get full 90 minutes against a really good, uh, against a good City team, not the full strength City, but still some really good players in there. I think that's only going to help him uh, going forward. So I think everyone probably would just like to see him play in central midfield at <clears> point <throat> in that number six role. But that's always going to be difficult when you've got yeah, players such as Rodrigo Benteke and Ibra Zuma ahead of you in the pecking order, but I think he'll just be grateful for the minutes uh, in the Tottenham shape because it is a big jump going from the Championship to the Premier League, and he's only 18 years old at the end of the day. Uh, so I think last night will certainly help him uh, going forward. The thing with last night is like what the, the occasions where he did get forward, um, if if a move then broke down quickly, he's having to kind of chase back really quickly yeah. again against another team might not be able to get the ball moving as quickly as Man City do and get kind of focus on that, the, the, the area that's kind of been, the hole that's been left essentially. Um, so yeah, I, d I did notice a couple of times when he's got forward and we've lost the ball, he's done to then kind of track back quickly. He, he wants to get forward. Um, it's, it's an Ange Postacoglu system. He's seen what Pedro Porro can do in a from right back in an Ange Postacoglu system. He he was, I think he was desperate to kind of make his mark and, and push like Pedro does, push into that central midfield area, which is where he, where he naturally wants to be. Um, just couldn't really do it against Man City last night, I don't think, really. No. Uh, we've mentioned Basuma. Uh, I think all the subs more than played the part last night. They really made an impact. But Ben Davis was good at centre-back alongside uh, Radu Dragasin, Romero, there was one, one moment where he left the ball across the box. Just I think it was Davis that completely left it. And then someone else behind him left it. I'm like having kittens sitting there thinking, well, someone get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a bit of a strange sub. I think one no one expected as well, taking Romero off. Uh, this was, what, about eight, nine minutes into yeah. the second half. Uh, Ange was asked about him in his press conference, uh, basically said... Cootie was a bit tired. We think he said tired. It could be tight. There's been this situation already this season where we don't know if it's tired or tight, but basically he was saying he contemplated changing him at half time, but after losing Mickey, he didn't want to lose another sense of that. Uh, Romero said he was okay, but uh, his gut feeling was there's no point taking a risk with him. So take him off, bring Ben Davis on. And Davis did well in his game time. I thought Romero was good as well when he was playing and uh, yeah it's just probably the right decision at the, at the end of the day we saw it 12 months ago Spurs losing all the influential players all in one go and that's the last thing you want that's happened last night to lose your two first choice centre-backs yeah exactly with Mickey van der Ven likely to to miss this weekend's game against Aston Villa given how he looked when he came off as you say there the last thing you want is for Christian Romero to to be injured as well and going into a game against Aston Villa which 
given Spurs' form in the Premier League so far this season, is a pretty crucial game um, against a team that you would expect to be challenging for the top four places coming the end of the season, like they did last year. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to go into that with a with a kind of second choice um, backline essentially. So if you can if you can treat Christian Romero right and make sure he's okay for the weekend, then so much the better. And and then you've got Romero and Dragasin playing at centre back essentially against one of the one of the better teams in the Premier League, we should say. Yeah, uh, Richarlison he came on about twenty minutes from time. I thought he was good last night, Richarlison in terms of. Uh, his work off the ball, uh, the dirty work, what he does bring to the team, uh, some key defensive moments, someone who could just help relieve the pressure. And he went on a couple of good runs, uh, drew some fouls. But I think the one thing fans will point to <laughs> is is that miss when Josko Gavardiol's throw in just inadvertently fell into his path, put it one on one with Ortega, took it first time, and uh. Not a good attempt at all, really. Didn't even make Ortega work. It was straight down his throat. And a bit of a tame effort in the end. And I think he knew he blew a big chance there. You could just tell by his reaction. Even a couple yep. of minutes after he'd missed it, camera panned back to him and he was still shaking his head. But other than that, I thought he played well in that game of time. Yeah, do you know, so I've always... I've always thought Richarlison and his the work that the work rate that he puts in has, has always been strong. And I, I was going to ask you, do you do you think having kind of you you've seen it at Everton um, and you're a big fan of his, obviously? Um, do you think his time on the sidelines and watching the effort and the work that Dominic Solanke puts in um, on the pitch has given him a little bit of a kind of not a kick up the backside because I don't think he needed it because he's always worked hard, but just giving him that little extra kind of push. Um, when he come because he did really put himself about last night, I thought when he came on, um, and wasn't wasn't a surprise because I've seen him do it, but I just, I just don't I don't know I just feel like that competition with Solanke might have just given him a little bit of a, a push that he, he needs. Maybe give him a, a little bit of a push. Uh, he's always worked hard on on the left side when he was at Everton. That's why Everton fans absolutely adore him because that's what you want from your players. Yeah just work hard for the team, give 110%. And that's what he does. And that's what he's done at Tottenham. Now, it maybe hasn't fully worked out for him since this £60 million move. The goals maybe haven't flowed for him on a regular basis and the injuries certainly haven't helped. But he'll always uh, do his best for the team, give as much as he can. And yeah, maybe Solanke's move has maybe given him a bit of a kick up the backside slightly because look at the effort Dom's putting in up front. The goals aren't there for him. A lot will probably point to is it three goals in what, 12 games now. Yeah. But if you look at the work he's putting in and the players around him are actually benefiting, Rich is, in terms of wanting to start as a central striker, it's going to be incredibly hard for him to do in the Premier League while Solanke's playing as he is. And then you look, Richie's played a lot of his football on the left previously. You've got Sonny there as well. There's competition all over. So when you're given minutes, you've just got to take your opportunities, really. Uh, I was a bit gutted he didn't score because I imagine he probably had a T-shirt with justice for Vinnie Jr. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was kicking off, wasn't he? About, yeah, he was. Uh, Vinicius not winning the Ballon d'Or the other day. Uh, but yeah, those chances will come for him. The more minutes will come. And I think it's just nice now to have a couple of options yeah. on the left and up front as well because injuries have just killed him this season. The one uh, There was one one moment that kind of it both frustrated me but also showed me how desperate he is to kind of yeah. prove himself, essentially. There was, I think... I don't know whether we'd just gone into injury time or if it was just before injury time, but he'd won, he won the ball in his own half and kind of got away from a couple of Man City players and looked up and tried to play the ball in behind for Solanke. Yeah. Um, and I'm there thinking, Solanke's run himself into the ground. He's not going to win that. And it's like, just keep the ball, Rishi. Just keep the ball. You don't need to pass it and try and get us on the attack. So um, just a little bit of game management, I think, there. But he it kind of shows that he was desperate to get on the front foot and wanted us to get forward and, and score another goal. And he wanted to be part of something that's... Um, part of us scoring another goal, essentially. But um, yeah, it kind of equal parts frustration, but also kind of admiration for, for what he's trying to do. 
I mean, if he's not going to be starting games, he's great impact player to bring off the bench. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can look at the game at Liverpool last season where he scored and yeah. he got an assist when they were 4 0 down and gave Spurs a bit of late hope. Same against Arsenal in the North London derby. Came on, Spurs looked better for having him in the team. Uh, but as I said, it's just one of these you've got Solanke, you've got Son in the team. You're just going to have to do the best you can with minutes that come your way. And as you said, it's the same with Dragerson who probably will get a run in the team now. We, we best stop, really, because um, Ali will come back from his holiday and accuse us of having a Richarlison loving while he's while he's been away, <laughs> even though he missed a glorious chance in front of goal. So, um, yeah, we, we we should probably stop with uh, Richarlison uh, there, shouldn't we? <laughs> oh, so he's coming back from this holiday? Just... <laughs> Apparently, yeah. He's, he's right. going to come back at some point, I, I hope. Right. Uh, so... Cup draw was last night, straight after the game. uh, Tottenham, home to Manchester United. Week commencing December the 16th. Probably looking like it's going to be the Wednesday. uh, Just because Spurs are playing on the Sunday prior to that. And I think Manchester United the same as well. Uh, But I think that's all you want in terms of a cup draw. Just a game at home. I think the ideal fixtures would probably one of Southampton, Palace or Brentford. But since Andrew's been at the club, in terms of the domestic cup draws, he's always had tough ones. I mean, go back to last season, uh, second round, you you were away at Fulham, one of the better teams in the draw when you could have got a team from League One, League Two. Man City in the fourth round of the FA Cup uh, last season, City in the fourth round of the Carabao Cup this time. So it's going to be an interesting one because this you imagine will be a new look Manchester United uh, team with Ruben Amarim, who's expected to take over. And I think all you can ask for is just home advantage at this stage of the draw. Yeah, I was pleased last night they was at home with we the first team out, obviously. Um, and then when I saw it was Manchester United, I was thinking, well, Liverpool were in there and Arsenal were in there. And Newcastle yeah. probably would have liked to avoid as well. Um, so, yeah, thinking uh, Manchester United is not too bad. Um, at home, given how we performed against them a few weeks ago, obviously in the Premier League, and then you kind of you kind of flip and think, well, they're going to have a new manager. Um, it might be a completely different Man United team and one that's kind of rejuvenated. Um, but then you flip, and then I flipped again today, essentially from last night, and, and looked at it and thought, well, they're struggling a little bit in the Europa League. Um, he, his kind of raison d'être will be to to get them up the table in the Premier League and focused. Um, the Europa League, they'll want to improve on that. So they'll use a strong squad in, in the Premier League and a strong squad, you would think, in the Europa League. They might rest a few players and they might he might not take the Carabao Cup quarterfinal as seriously as, as some other games around that sort of time because December is a busy month for all clubs in the top flight. So, um, yeah, but again, don't, as I say, I've, I've spoken a lot about thinking about Man United there. Don't, yeah, I don't really think we need, we're at, as you say, we're at home. Um <laughs> I think we're a better side than Man United. So if if Ange plays a similar sort of team, gives a couple of players a rest and gives a couple of the, the likes of Archie Gray an opportunity, L- Lucas Bergvall perhaps, and Mikey Moore coming off the bench last night, a, a little bit of an opportunity. I, d- I don't see why we should fear playing Man United at home in, in the quarterfinals, really. Um, and then you're kind of, then you're really looking to, looking to, to get to a final, aren't you? If, you? if you can come through this, you're kind of semi-final away from from reaching Wembley, which we're, as Spurs fans, have been waiting for for a long time. Yeah, and let's be honest, United aren't want to kind of come to see Spurs and play. It's a really tough draw uh, for them. So the other ties, it's Arsenal, Crystal Palace, Newcastle, Brentford and Southampton, Liverpool. So some really strong teams in there uh, because I think it was last year was Chelsea against Borough in one of the semi-finals in Fulham, Liverpool in the other one. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the three teams that I said there that I really wanted to avoid in the quarterfinal are, will be the ones that are waiting, I imagine, in the semi-final. Um, I can't see Brentford beating Newcastle at St. James's Park. Um, I can't see Southampton, even though they're at home, beating Liverpool. Um, and Arsenal at home to Crystal Palace should be should be a win for um, them lot down the road. Um, so yeah, it could be a, it could be quite a good quarter final, uh, semi final, um, semi final lineup really, pr- providing Spurs get there. Otherwise, I'll have no interest in it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if you're gonna win the trophy, you're gonna have to beat the best at some point. Exactly. And, uh, Tottenham, pretty tough run so far. 
City United next up. It's going to be uh, going to be a good one. We've got to wait well, about six, seven weeks for this one to come around, there, uh, but it'll come around pretty quick. Next up, Villa uh, on Sunday at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Villa shock exit last night in the cup. That everyone yeah. would probably had them down to beat Crystal Palace at home, but in the league, they're. Uh, they're going well so far this season. A bit unfortunate last weekend with Bournemouth scoring a late equaliser at Villa Park, but they seem to have, uh, you know, just carried on the momentum from last season, going strong in the Premier League. Unai Emery's made, he's formed a really good team uh, in the Midlands, and you'd expect them to be challenging for the top four once again. A repeat of the first 45 minutes at home to Villa last <laughs> season would be nice, but this time with a number of goals um, because it was Villa who came out on top in the end. But this is going to be a big test. And I think for Spurs, the issue this season has been they've just been so inconsistent in the league. Four wins, one draw, four defeats. After the higher beat in Manchester City, you need to follow it up with another win. Yeah, um, they're not just going well in the Premier League either. They're kind of the top of the Champions yeah, League yeah. league phase as well, aren't they? Which my wife was stunned by when I when I mentioned it last night. Um, I think her response was, what, above Bayern Munich and Real Madrid and that lot? I was like, yes, Aston Villa of three wins uh, from three. So, yeah, it's, it's not going to be easy. You know, I've got um, a lot of time for Unai Emery. Um, I, I, I thought he was a little bit harshly treated by Arsenal, although looking at Arsenal now, they will they will say that it was the right decision. Um but yeah, I've, I've always I've always liked him um, as a manager. Always done how many how many Europa League titles did he win? Um, crazy amount, wasn't it? Um, yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he's got he's got Villa playing um, rightly um, deservedly beat us to um, fourth place last year. I thought in the end. Um, and yeah, they're, they're showing that it's not just a one season wonder under Uno Emery. So yeah, it's going to be a tough game. But like you said, I thought we were excellent in both games against Villa last year. Yeah. Should have should have won both games. Um, the uh, yeah, the the home defeat was when I was in New York, which um, put me in a bad mood while I was wandering around um, New York City Centre afterwards, so watching it in the uh, in the pub out in the Spurs pub out there. But hopefully, um, different this time around. But as you say, it's just inconsistency. Are we going to see the team that beat West Ham? Or are we going to see the team that meekly lost to Crystal Palace last weekend? Yeah, hopefully there'll be a bit of a boost on the injury front with Son coming back. Uh, that Ange said he's pretty much getting there and. We're just going to save him for this weekend rather than rushing him back and putting him in against City. Uh, and you'll be speaking to the media tomorrow at 1 pm. So we'll hopefully have a fresh update on the latest with Mickey van der Ven and whether Son and Jed Spence will be uh, back in the squad. Uh, so I think we'll leave that there for today's latest episode of Golden Guest Top. Tottenham will be back next week to reflect on the. Aston Villa game and then also look ahead to the Europa League tight against Galatasaray so as when ever, the, uh, the gold side of the team will be back then as well yeah so <laughs> we don't need to rename the pod I no. think we'd have to if it kept going <laughs> yeah right we'll be back next week as ever thank you for listening in and just keep with us at football.london for all your latest Tottenham news to get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. Our link will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the podcast episode description box.